What's up? Hi. How y'all doing? Y'all doing all right? Hi. Hi. Sweet. Everybody good? Hey, anybody got a bracket that's unbusted? A basketball bracket? Anybody? Do you speak of the English? Like anybody, you got a bracket that's unbusted? Tyler, you really do? No, who is that? Isaiah? What, what you got? Do you got a br- unbusted bracket? I, I guessed every single one. I swear to you. That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> so um, what you need to understand, if you're not basketball fans, I'm actually not, is they have these brackets on who you think's going to win the NCAA tournament, all that junk. Whatever. So anyway, all right. Shh. More importantly... My name is Caleb, I'm a student pastor. I'm glad you came to hang out tonight. Here's what I need you to do real quick. Here's what I need you to do. Shh. I need your phones, I need you to take them out, put those suckers on vibrate, silent, put them like away from you so they don't distract you. And I just ask you to do that just because I believe this is an important time. That we're gonna look at God's word that here we believe is, um, is living, active, holy, applicable, useful for your life. Um, and so... I just want to use this time away from distraction. Anything happening on that phone, you can look at in the next 15 minutes, um, and you don't have to worry about that right now. And so I'm just going to encourage you to do that. I'm going to pray for us real quick, and we're going to get going tonight. God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for my friends here, Lord. I thank you for bringing us here uh, in this place. Lord, I thank you for uh, your word. I ask that you would give us understanding of it and focus uh, Lord, that we would see, uh, see it and, and understand it, how it was meant to be understood and seen and applied to our life. God, that tonight we'd find hope and peace uh, and strength in you and new life in you, God. That you do mighty works that only you can in our hearts. Um, Lord, that you'd give us focus. We love you. Thank you for all you're doing. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, we're doing this new series. If you're here for the first time, you need to know this is the first week of this series called Shook. And what, uh, the reason we did it is because talking to several students, having different conversations in different contexts, um, there's a lot of you when it comes to, to Jesus or the things about Jesus, you are shook, like straight up. And so here's the definition you need to know. We're kind of working on this definition of shook. It's emotionally or physically disturbed, upset, shocked or surprised. For example, when that girl saw that giant beach ball, she was shook. Exactly. Right. So, so that is what we're talking about, man. When you're, when you're upset, you're emotionally disturbed, you, you are not right. You are surprised. You are shocked. You're shook. For some of you, you are like me, that when I was your age, I would sit in church I would sit in, in the seats that you're sitting in with, with a person uh, much like myself standing up here speaking. And they would come to the end of their message and they would say, hey, does anyone want to know Jesus? And if you do, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. And they would go into talking about, and which I totally believe is true and, and is right, that they would go into talking about um, praying that, and telling God, confessing to God that, that we are sinful and we are in need of a savior and that we're trusting that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and, and offered forgiveness and, and we want to be forgiven and asking for forgiveness and asking God to be the Lord of our life. They would ask that. They would say, hey, if you want to do that, I want to invite you to pray that prayer. And what you need to understand is that I had a lot of doubt in my salvation. If I was saved or if I wasn't saved, it was very situational like, I was so afraid Jesus was going to come back and, and I was going to be left. There's a, a verse in the Bible that says um, that he will come back like a thief in the night. Like, that you won't expect it. You won't know it when Jesus comes back. And so literally one Christmas, I was for sure, when, when else would Jesus come back except on his birthday, right? Christmas Eve, like, he's coming back tomorrow. And so this is what I did. Literally, I stayed up all night, not because I wanted to see Santa Claus, No, I stayed up all night because I was like, I'm expecting you, Jesus. And if I'm expecting you, then you can't come back while I'm thinking about it. 
And so I'm just gonna sit here and think about it all night. And so literally, I was like a fourth grader, fifth grader, I was just up all night because I was so scared that Jesus was gonna come back and I didn't believe that I was truly saved. I, I didn't know, like I doubted it. And so when somebody would come and say, hey, do you wanna pray this prayer? I never raised my hand, I never stood up, I never came up front, but I prayed it every single time in hopes that this last time would be the time that I would be saved. I believe that if a prayer, like that, that a prayer could actually save me. I believe that, that if I said a certain kind of words and I felt a certain kind of way when I said a certain kind of words, that, that maybe that would save me. And so I struggle with a lot of doubt. What you need to understand is doubt from, from this kind of relationship comes um, not because we know God's promises, but they, become, they come because we're trusting our feelings. I tell you this a lot, that doubt is the, is the product of trusting feelings over promises. That when it comes to God, when it comes to knowing if God is here and believing that God is with us and that he has saved us, a lot of doubt happens when our situational feelings, meaning as situations change, our feelings change. As our day goes, our feelings change. Man, we're having a good day, we're having a bad day based on how other people acted, based on what went on that day. I'm, I could be having a great day, I could get in a car wreck, I could tell everyone else, man, my day was terrible, yet 90% of it was great. I had 1%, 10%, whatever the math is, 10% of my day was a car wreck. So I'd say my whole day was awful. It was situational, right? My feelings changed. And so what often happens is when it comes to God and our relationship with God, that we begin to assess our feelings on whether we're saved or not, on whether he loves us or not, whether we have a relationship with him or not. Our feelings are inconsistent. And so doubt happens. And it's the product of trusting our feelings over knowing God's promises. And when bad things happen, the first thing you begin to listen to is your feelings. When hard things happen, we listen to our feelings and, instead of God's promises first. And so doubt happens. I lived in this world of doubt and what I know is because my friends did too and what I know is that you do also. Is that some of you in this room, you can relate like, man, yes, especially those that have been raised in church. You're like, yes, absolutely, I am with you. I pray it every time to this day because just in case, just in, I just wanna know and, and, and I doubt that's what I love about God's words because it's full of his promises. In John 3.16, this guy John records something that Jesus said. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus being, if you've, this is your first time here, maybe it's your first time at church ever, what you need to know is that, um, well, we believe this right here. That God, the creator of the universe, who created all things, who is over all and, and through all and in all and, and who is uh, and has always been God, loved the world in this way. That he gave his only son, Jesus, so that everyone who would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. And he says eternal life and he's talking when he says perish, eternal death. So that you would not die an eternal death but you would have an eternal life. That The Bible says, man, the consequences of our sin is death. It is a separation from God that that is the payment, the price of our sin. But yet, God loved us in this way that he gave Jesus his own son his perfect son, to die in our place. That we trust our feelings over it so much, but yet his word says in a verse that most of us have heard maybe a hundred times, that he gave his son that everyone, anyone who would believe in Jesus would not perish but have everlasting life. He goes on in John 5, this is what he says. He says, truly I tell you, anyone who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment, but is passed from death to life. He says, I'm telling you, anyone who hears my words, this is Jesus right, he says, anyone who hears and believes that I have come to pay the price for your sin, to save you from your sins, like you've trusted me and you placed your faith in that, 
So often the problem is, though, is that we believe the word believe. We believe this word believes. Anyone who believes, anyone who says it, then they believe. Yet we are not honest people. That maybe even in our minds we believe it, but our hearts and our lives don't act on it. That our words believe it. It's like someone who's cheating on someone else in a relationship. Hey, I love you, I care for you, but in our heart, we have different desires. And our minds are going different places, but yet our mouths and kind of our, our external actions, they say one thing, but really what's happening inside is different. And so often we take believe as if we pray a certain prayer. Anyone who hears my words and prays a certain prayer, man, he will have life. He will not come under judgment. That's not what he's saying. This word believe is, is a bigger word than that. There's a stronger word than that. And I would, I would ask, man, have you truly believed with your life? Does your life say that your belief system has changed? Does your life say and, and tell the world about what you really believe about God and who he is and his call in your life? He says, the one who believes will not come under judgment but will pass from death, a destiny for death, to a destiny for eternal life. You will be saved, you will be rescued. John, this guy, he like writes a lot of this, and, and we're gonna go down to this last passage. I'm gonna read two more, but, but the last passage I'm gonna read for you kind of talks about why he writes this, but it's over and over again of him writing about Jesus' promises. In, in John 1, 12 to 13, he says this. He says, but all who did receive him, he gave them the right to be children of God, to, do, to those who believed in his name, who were born not of natural descent, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. That word born means, meaning, like, it means new life. Like you were born, like you know what it is to be, if you went to health class, right, what birth looks like, it's gross. But... He's saying, man, this is, this is not a born of man. It's not a born of your own desires. It's not born because people caused birth. No, it is, it is born of God. It says anyone who would receive Jesus and then believe in Jesus. You've got to know those are two things. Anyone who would receive and to those who would believe. Some of you have received a lot of truth. I get it, I get it, I get it, but you haven't truly believed. He says, no, no, that person who is born of God, new life, new way, a life that says, man, I am a new creation in God. The fruit of my life says something different about the root of my life. He says, man, that person is a new creation. You know an interesting statistic is that 70% of you in here, when you graduate high school, will drop out of church. That you will not go to church. And, and of those 70%, 80% of those 70% will not have planned on it. So 70% of you, let's just say there's, there's not quite, uh, I mean, there's probably 70 of you in here right now. So I don't know that math, but let's assume there's 100 of you in here. And 70 of you decided you're not going to church again. So 80% of those 70 would not have planned on it at this time in their life that they were not going to go to church again. 80% of them. 80% of them are going to say, no, I'll probably continue to go to church the rest of my life. But yet, you stop. You get to school. Things get busy. Things get tough. Uh, things get uncomfortable, things are new, you don't know what church to go to, you don't know what time it starts, all of that stuff. And you make excuses and you get in the habit, you're not going to church, you're just doing school, all of this. That you didn't make plans for your future and so plans just happen to make what you look like. And, and that's just what happens, 80% of you. Now of those 70% who left the church, a third of them will never come back. So of the 70 in here that would have left and, and not, and left the church, that, that a third of you, roughly 
25 or whatever, won't ever come back to church. And the question you ask, you gotta ask is why? Why, what, what happens to that? What happens to those 25 that would never, never come back to church? Like what, what would be the reasoning for that? And here's the reasoning that I believe is that they were never born of God. That they came to church, that you heard all the things, you externally were able to produce all the things and say all the things and act out all the things, but you know in your heart There's no relationship there. There's no no understanding that, that, man, I'm connected to the God of this this world, the creator of everything, and and he loves me, and he speaks to me, and and, and I get to talk to him, and he shows me his plans, and he tells me when I'm not kind of doing right, and and he encourages me when I am, and he's with me in the hard times. Like, you know that's not there. Yet these people, I believe, they think they have it. They think they've experienced all God has to offer because they prayed a prayer. And then they go and the world hits them in the face. And they're like, where's God now? But yet they never knew God. But they were under this lie, this thought that, man, I am saved because I I knew the right answers. God said, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about those who truly, man, say, man, I, I'm, I'm surrendering my life to you. I, I'm, I'm believing in you. That for the people at this time, this was a, a right here, boys. The, the people at this time, this was like revolutionary. This was crazy for them. The two people were in this, in this listening arena. Ones that were like, nah, I don't believe it. Jesus isn't the guy. And the other people were like, this is changing my life. God is, a cha- like, I, I am sold out for him. I recognize Jesus as the one that God promised to save us from our sin. And so they were changed. What they didn't have You need to hear this is they didn't have a bunch of people who prayed some prayers and pulled out a salvation card and said, hey, man, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, but when it comes time for that dying thing, I'm saved. I'm good. I got it. There wasn't a bunch of people who were living out their faith with a mediocre enthusiasm, meaning a halfway, I'm not really caring about it. I'll say the things, I've got the things, but I don't really, I'm still gonna do my own thing. They're mediocre. There wasn't there. That's what we deal with now. It's people who think this applies to a mediocre faith, and what you need to know is the people who live in the mediocre are the people who often struggle with the most doubt about their salvation, and the people who are living in the mediocre are the people who should struggle with doubt about their salvation because they have a lot of reason to doubt whether God has saved their life or whether they just prayed a prayer. There's been no life change. God's calling for a full life change, a a new birth, a born again experience. But some of you in here, you're like, no, I I think I know Jesus. Like I I truly believe in him and I I truly try to follow him and and I know I mess up and that's what we all do. But but God forgives me and I'm broken over my sin, but but yet he changes me. You need to understand that then doubt, you need to understand we, we still have doubt that still happens, but that doubt comes from the enemy and you need to understand is that you combat that doubt with promises, with God's promises. That that's what happens here. You're called to combat that with God's promises and not listen. And so in closing, here's just what I wanna share with you. This is the last thing that he, that he wrote as you consider you know, your, your life. And this is 1 John 5, 11 through 13. This is another book he wrote. He says, and this is a testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in the Son. The one who has the Son has life. Straight up. 
And the one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I've written these things to you to, so that you who believe in the name of the Son of God, for those, <laughs> I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. He said, I've written these things so that you would know, so that you would look into God's word and then you would know that you would be assured of your salvation that you would know I have the son and I'm trusting him in everything and, and, and I'm choosing to live for him. And you would know that you have life. And for those who just said some words but don't truly know Jesus or maybe have never even asked God to, to save you, that you would recognize, man, I don't have the son and I don't have life. He says, I'm, I'm writing this so you would know so you know and so you believe.